Hello and welcome to our service. We're so glad you joined us today. We do want to take a minute to say a special happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. We hope you feel extra special and loved throughout the day today. My name is Chrissy Sisko. I'm the Children's Ministry Director. And I'm Dana Kickline, Administrative Director. Now take a look at some of the announcements we have coming up. Welcome to Cornerstone Church and thank you for joining us for today's service. Here are a few ways for you and your family to stay connected. VBS signups are now open for children who have completed kindergarten through the fifth grade. VBS is going to be held at Muser Park in Wilson from June 27th to July 1st from 9 a.m. to 12 noon each day. We're extending our invitation beyond our church walls to include the children attending Wilson Elementary School. Therefore, our spaces are limited. Please sign up today at the Next Steps area or on our website. Please join us at our 2nd Street campus for our annual meeting that will be held on June 26th at 1.30 p.m. The annual report was emailed out and a paper copy is also available for you in the back. Our Bright Hopes annual baby bottles are due this weekend. Please drop off the baby bottles on your way out from the service today. If you forgot to bring them today, please drop them off at our Marsh Street Campus Church office as soon as possible. Our next baptism will be held on Sunday, July 17th and August the 21st at 3 p.m. If you are interested in being baptized, please fill out the form on our website. Baptism classes are required to be baptized. Classes will be held at Marsh Street Campus on Sunday, July 10th and August the 7th 12 30 p.m. and lunch will be served. Here are some of the ministries that are offered at Cornerstone Church. We have two campuses, one on March Street in College Hill and one on South 2nd Street in downtown Easton. Children's ministry is offered during our 9 a.m. service at March Street and our 10 a.m. service at 2nd Street on Sunday. And nursery is provided for the 9 a.m. service at March Street and both the Saturday night and Sunday morning services at 2nd Street. The youth group has a worship service, games, and fellowship on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. at 2nd Street Campus. Our men's ministry meets the first Saturday of every month, as well as hosting a yearly retreat. The women's ministry offers Bible studies and other events, such as the recent wellness workshop and women's retreat. Riverside Ministry serves the community on Monday nights with meals, clothing donations, and spiritual food of the gospel each week. The backbone of our ministries are community and discipleship groups where small group fellowships and Bible studies are done to grow together in faith. For more information, please visit our website at cornerstonechurches.org. And here's a quick look into what our worship is like here at Cornerstone, followed by this week's sermon. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. We will sing your praise. 
those snippets of our worship. And we hope to see you in person sometime soon. And now Pastor Tim's going to take us back into our Summer in the Sun series, where he's going to be looking at how people responded when Jesus was preaching in his hometown. There we go. Luke 4, verses 16 through 30. And he came up to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as he was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What you have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who is a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah. And none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for reading that, Dan. And uh, I would encourage all of us, let's have your Bibles out. And if you are listening to this online, then I would encourage you to get your Bibles out as well. Let's be people of God's Word. There's just something about having God's Word open in front of you and to be able to study it, to mark it up. Uh, I really, I've always believed that a marked up Bible leads to a marked up life. And so I would encourage you to do that as well. You know, the Puritans used to say that God had only one son and he made him a preacher. And they said this, I believe, because preaching was the primary ministry of Jesus on earth. In fact, Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 38, let us go to the next town, or the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. So we're going to be hearing a sermon of Jesus. And it's going to have the, the setting, it's going to be done in the setting of a synagogue. And I'm going to tell you all about synagogues in that day, and I'm going to tell you as well as I can what he was preaching, why he said it. And what I'm going to ask you to do and it's something that I have to do for myself as well, is to now take it into your own heart. What he preached to the Jewish people in that synagogue, he is preaching to you right now, except it's through this message. So I want to encourage you to internalize, to really invite Jesus to speak to your own life. Do you do that, by the way? When you hear a sermon, wherever you are, do you invite God to speak through that preacher? into your own life, humble, knowing that you need the living and active Word of God, that it will go down deep into your heart. It will unzip it for you. God will show you what He sees, and then He will begin to encourage you. And I hope that you, hope, I hope you have that expectation. So Luke tells us in chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus went to Galilee. Now, Galilee is a region... In northern Israel, he was previously down below Jerusalem in the Judean wilderness. 
We looked at that last week when he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. You have to go 80 to 90 miles north, and you're going to get to Galilee. It's a region in northern Israel. It's a region that's 50 miles north to south and 25 miles east to west. So if you can picture in your mind the, uh, the proximity, or rather the size of Galilee, the Galilean region, 50 miles by 25 miles, And then we read in verse 16, the second part of it, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, what do you know about synagogues? The synagogue was basically Jewish church in the first century. It was a meeting house, a synagogue was. It was created, uh, synagogues were created during the 70 years that Israel was forced into exile way up into Babylon. They could not go to the temple in Jerusalem. So they created these synagogues as a place to have prayer, to hear the word of God read, to hear the word of God preached, to have fellowship, to sing songs. Really not unlike what we do today, at least in some form. And they were built the same way all the world over. Did you know that about synagogues? Wherever you went to a synagogue, wherever it was, Roman Empire or anywhere in Israel, and there were hundreds of them, they were always built the same way. The entrance always faced toward Jerusalem. They were Jewish schools for children. They were worship centers. They were ministry centers. They were benevolent centers, believe it or not. And they had a balcony, and in the balcony was where the women would sit with the children. And then they would have on the floor where the men would sit in benches or in pews. And in one section directly in front of the entrance, all the way to the opposite side of the synagogue, was a closet, what they called an ark. And that's what contained the scrolls of Scripture. It was meant to center on the Word of God. Now, there's lots of little things that we're going to encounter along the way in this message, and that's the first one of them, is your life centered on the Word of God. Do you bring the Word of God to church? Now, I really want to ask you that. Do you bring your Bible to church? Now, I know we're 21st century. We've got it all on our phones. Do you bring your Bible to church? Do you mark up your Bible, the very same Bible that you are in all week long? Are you bringing that to church? Friends, I crave for you to do that. I hunger for you to do that. In fact, I really want to see all of us doing that because I want us to be a church that is centered on God's Word. Why? Because even the synagogues were worshiping, or centered rather, in their worship on God's word. You know, we have modern church bells. You know, the purpose of the church bell was supposed to be to call the people in your town to come to worship. It was time to worship, so the church bells would ring. You know what they had back then? They had shofars, and shofars were long ram horns and they would blow the shofars and that was a signal in the town or the city all around the community it was time to come to synagogue this the start of the service was about to begin so each synagogue had a ruler it was called synagogue ruler you hear about them in the new testament they were the Uh, the head of the synagogue, and then they had an assistant called an executive ruler, or rather an executive officer. And the executive officer handled all the details of the service. You would go to synagogue, psalms would be sung, scriptures would be read, and then often a visiting teacher would be asked to preach. Now look at verse 17. Jesus was that visiting teacher. He was asked to preach, so he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Now, all over the world in that day, they all were at the same place in their Bible readings. They would read different sections each Saturday. That was their day of the synagogue, the day of their prayers and worship. They would, all over, this, all over Israel, the, the synagogues were reading from the same section of scripture. 
And then they would read not only from the Pentateuch, not only from the first five books of the Bible, here's your example from Isaiah, they would be reading from the prophets as well, from the Psalms, from the Pentateuch, from the prophets. And they, their Bibles, by the way, were not like these. In fact, they were all written on scrolls, and they were incredibly expensive. The average person, by the way, this is one reason that I so encourage you to be in your own Bible and bringing your own Bible to church. Do you not know that until the printing press, Bibles were not affordable by the average person? The only person that had the Bibles were the professional ministers. We live in a day and age where you might have multiple Bibles at home. And sometimes that, that, that accessibility to your Bible leads towards or lends towards a bit of an apathy. It wouldn't have back then because if you owned one of these scrolls, it meant you were incredibly wealthy. Almost nobody did. And by the way, you, lo you really wouldn't own one because the average Jewish person in the first century can no longer read Hebrew. And the scrolls were written in Hebrew. Their scrolls were about 11 inches high, between 20 and 30 feet long, and they were rolled up in wooden dowels. So when Jesus got up to read, here's what he's doing. Hebrew is written from the right to the left, not left to right like our English language. So he's unrolling with the left while he was rolling with the right until he found the section in Isaiah that he was going to preach. He finds the section. And while he's reading, he's translating it into Aramaic language. That was the language of the common Jew. And it was a very fam familiar passage. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Isaiah 61. And this is Luke 4:18. He's quoting it. Because he has anointed me. Now there's his text. Let me tell you a little bit more before he reads a little bit more of his text. He's going to read just under two verses. By the way, let me tell you, the custom was you were to read no less than three verses. Jesus breaks that custom. I'll tell you why in a little bit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. What's that word anointed mean? Now, this is really, really important. Anointed is a word when you translate it, it gives you the root word for Christ. Jesus is his birth name. Christ is not his last name. It's a title. So Jesus Christ, Jesus, Yahweh saves. Christ is the anointed one. It means the Messiah. So for us to call Jesus Christ, it is to claim by faith that he is the Messiah. By the way, this is why it is so critical. Don't ever use Jesus Christ as a profanity. You're taking the sacred and bringing it down to the secular, the common. That is a breach of the first commandment. You do not bring it down. Jesus Christ, Yahweh saves the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah through which Yahweh saves or is Yahweh who saves. That's what it means, Jesus Christ. He is the anointed one. He goes on, verse 18, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now he's quoting this from Isaiah 61. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty, freedom, those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now he's taking this passage from Isaiah and he's applying it to himself. And he's telling us what his mission is. Look what it says. To proclaim good news. That word, good news, evangelion, is the word gospel. So he is preaching. That's what proclaim means. He's preaching the gospel. If you ever get the opportunity to preach, or if you ever get the opportunity to teach somebody, you must center it, focus it on the good news of Jesus, the gospel. His message was good news, and it was good news to the poor, to the captives, to the blind. And it was news that was good because it was all about the year of the Lord's favor. 
Now, let me tell you something about this. This is really, really interesting, and you might, you might not know it if you don't do a little bit of a background. Do you know what Jesus is talking about? When he says, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the year of Jubilee. Do you know what the year of Jubilee is? It's a year that God commanded in the Old Testament to occur every 50 years. And in the year of Jubilee, if you owed somebody money, the, the creditor, the one who gave you, lent you the money, was to forgive you of your debt. If your crops wouldn't grow and you couldn't feed your family and you sold yourself into slavery, that's the common slavery of the Bible. If you sold yourself into slavery, meaning you you worked, you became an indentured servant to a landowner and you worked off your debt until you were free from that. Meanwhile, that landowner feeds your family. That's what slavery was in Israel. In the year of Jubilee, that landowner was to forgive you. He was to let you go, whether you filled, fulfilled all of your repayment or not. This is the year of Jubilee. It was a year to set all slaves free. And God's the one that commanded it. Now, we can't, we can't miss the opportunity to really bring this into our own modern world, all right? Let's do that for a moment. Tomorrow is Juneteenth, June 19th. It's actually federally being celebrated on Monday this year because it falls on Father's Day, but it's Juneteenth. Juneteenth, as you probably know, is the celebration that the message of Abraham Lincoln's emancipation of all slaves two and a half years after he gave it finally arrives in the last holdout of the horrific atrocity of, called slavery and it finally arrives to Galveston, Texas. And all the slaves in Galveston, Texas were set free. It's honored today, Juneteenth. It happened June 19, 1865. Now, church, we should celebrate this. This is the justice of God that has come to those unfairly made chattel and property of somebody else. Don't push back. Listen, my encouragement, don't push back. This is, don't, don't worry that this is a secular holiday. Christmas is a secular holiday. Don't push back on this. Celebrate because God has freed people from slavery. And it was all what the year of Jubilee was about. It was to be celebrated. It is to be celebrated. You know what? Do you know why it's to be celebrated? It's because now, through Abraham Lincoln's ministry, and it was a ministry, God exercised freedom because to God, all human beings are created in his image, regardless of your race or your color. There is no distinction. And we should celebrate that. Above above all else, above the world, we should celebrate it. God is the one that brought justice. All of this is in mind of Jesus. It is the year of Jubilee. But it's a year that focuses on him, the anointed one. You see, as incredibly important as Juneteenth is, as incredibly important as our laboring for those children being sold into sex slavery and getting them out of that, as important as all of this is, it does not compare with the direction that Jesus was really going. See, he was even going deeper and even more beautifully. The Bible is shouting, Jesus is preaching, I am here. This is your year of jubilee, and I am setting you free from something that has blinded you, that has held you captive, that you are in debt to, you are a prisoner to. It is killing you. It is taking your life from you. And that prison is sin. And I am redeeming 
redeeming you from it. You see, he is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He was sent by his father to redeem this sin-broken world. And in this passage, Jesus read Isaiah, who prophesied of a day when God would meet suffering with mercy, because God has a heart of compassion for the poor and for the downtrodden and the captives and the blind, and he's going to exercise that compassion through his people in modern day through his church in fact he said in Micah 6 8 he has told you oh man what is good what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God church we are the arm of God's justice it should come into the world through his people and while the compassion and mercy of God extends to all people who suffer in this world. Listen, it extends to a much deeper target, which is Isaiah's prophetic address. See, it's not about the social gospel. You know what the social gospel is? Let me just teach you something really quickly. This came in, I don't know, I think in, it really came raging into the church about four decades ago. The social gospel is that God is working through the church to reform our culture. You know, I don't think God's reforming our culture. You know what I think he's doing? I think he's spraying into existence in Christ his kingdom. And his kingdom is emerging in our culture. And that kingdom that's emerging in our culture is doing so through his church. And the more that we are salt and light, the more that we worship our God, the more that we give glory to him, that kingdom of God is becoming more radiant. And the kingdom of God is God's presence on earth. Now listen, where God is present, God's justice flows. God's goodness comes. See, what Isaiah is really talking about and what Jesus says when he applies this to him is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's the interpretive lens for all of what Christ spoke, all of what Christ did. He has a raging desire to save sinners. And Jesus says this himself, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know what a ransom is? A ransom is a, an amount of money that you had to pay to release somebody from slavery or to release somebody from a prison. Jesus says, I am the ransom. And I'm going to pay it through my death and my burial and my resurrection. And I am redeeming People who are caught up in bondage, who know that they are sinners, who understand that they're not right with God. In fact, the greatest sermon ever preached began with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He said, I have good news for those who understand that you are a captive and a prisoner of sin. I have good news for those who are stumbling around in spiritual darkness and you don't know how to be saved. I have good news for those being crushed in a world under the dominion of the prince of the air, Satan. The time to be set free is now. The Lord's favor is here. I am your Messiah. I am the anointed one. I have come to save you. Now, let me tell you what he's saying and we're gonna come back to this at the end. And I hope you can hear this. He's really saying this. Are you spiritually poor? Are you broken? Have you hit rock bottom? Realizing that your own righteousness, all those good works that you thought you were, that you were committing, all those nice things that you have done are not going to tip the scales and put God's favor upon you. It is absolutely impossible. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. It is why I have come, Jesus says. But you must understand, you cannot save yourself because you will never turn to me until you do. But that congregation 
in that synagogue was blind. Even while, look at verse 22, the eyes of all were fixed on him and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Look what happens. By the end of that church service, all spoke well of him, would turn to all in the synagogue, were filled with wrath. And they forced him out of the building to a cliff and they tried to enact the Old Testament execution of stoning where you throw the person off the cliff and the fall will not kill you, you begin to roll stones and throw stones down on the person. So what made them go from marveling at him to wanting to murder him from wonder to wrath? And the rest of the passage is going to help us discover that answer as we see why they would not believe. Number one, they wouldn't believe because of his familiarity. Look what they said, verse 22. Is this not Joseph's son? Now, Nazareth is his hometown. It's where he grew up. He was born in Bethlehem, spent a couple years in Egypt, the rest of his life until about 30, so about 27 and a half years, maybe 28, I don't know, maybe a little less, were spent growing up in Nazareth. Cousins were in Nazareth. Aunts and uncles were in Nazareth. Friends that he played with on the dirty, dusty streets of Nazareth were in that synagogue. Do you understand how familiar they were with Jesus? He's one of their own. They're saying, wow, I grew up with this guy. He's my cousin. He's my neighbor. We played ball together. I know him. He was Joseph's son. And by the way, didn't his father... Get his mom pregnant before they were married. You don't think they were thinking that? John chapter 8, verse 41. There were some who refused to believe in him and they kept saying, we were not born of sexual immorality. Our fathers didn't impregnate our mothers before they were married. We're not impure line. But you were, weren't you, Jesus? You see, familiarity breeds contempt. No prophet, look at verse 24, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. They would not believe because of his familiarity. But number two, they wouldn't believe because of their wrong expectations of the Messiah. See, it was Jewish custom to read no less than three verses in the synagogue. You remember I told you, if you were going to be asked to preach, you would get up to read, you would translate the Hebrew into the Aramaic, the common language. Not really too many people understood Hebrew anymore. But you were to not read less than three verses. Your preaching text had to be at least three verses. Jesus broke that custom. He read a little bit less than two verses From Isaiah 61. Now listen to this. He left out a very critical part. See, he ended his reading with to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But Isaiah had continued with these words. And the day of the vengeance of our God. And the day of the vengeance of of our God. Do you understand what the Jewish mindset was in the days of Jesus? The Messiah was going to come. The anointed one would be there. And he would usher in God's favor to us. We're Israel. But he would pour out his wrath on the Gentiles and especially their Roman captors. You see, Israel was in slavery to Rome. Rome had conquered them. They were just a vassal state. And they all thought, Jewish people did, that when when the Messiah comes, he's going to come militarily. He's going to come in might. And now all of their vengeance would come. All of their retribution would come. God would completely demolish and conquer and wipe out Rome. But Jesus stopped before that part, indicating it was time for God's favor, but not yet judgment on the Gentiles. 
Now, something you need to know, when you, go, when you grew up in a Jewish home, you went to the synagogue starting at five to six years old. And by the age of 10, there were some Jewish children that had memorized the entire Hebrew scriptures, believe it or not. See, they're not like our modern society where we don't need to remember our We don't need to remember people's cell phone numbers. Why? Because you could just direct dial it from your phone. They remembered everything. And they knew this passage. This was an incredibly familiar passage. It's one that was often preached. It was one that was a very zealous passage because their hope was that God was going to destroy the Gentiles. In fact, let me tell you this, that God, that Jewish teachers commonly taught that God created Gentiles so that he would have fuel for the fires of hell to burn. If you were a mom and a dad of a Jewish daughter and she married a Gentile, you held her wedding and her funeral on the same day. There was nothing worse to Jewish parents that their Jewish children would marry a Gentile man. Nothing faster endeared a Jewish congregation to a preacher than to preach on God's wrath to the Gentiles. But Jesus left that part out, and all of a sudden, some unrest started coming into that synagogue. Number three, they wouldn't believe because of their lack of true faith. Look at verse 23, and he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. I don't know how much you know about philosophy, if you've studied that in college or undergraduate or maybe even in high school, but uh, one of the more famous skeptic philosophers was Bertrand Russell, who once boasted what he would say to God if he ended up meeting him at a final judgment. He said, and I quote, not enough evidence, Lord, not enough evidence. Well, the congregation was muttering, it's easy, listen, Jesus of Nazareth, it's easy to claim that you are our Messiah, but we want you to prove it with miracles. Anybody can say it, show it. And Paul would later say, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. In other words, the fastest way to get a Jew to believe is showing them a sign. The fastest way to get a Greek to believe, argue with them about philosophy. But this faithless demand would be expressed again years later. It would be during the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is on the cross by this point in Luke 23. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. See, that would not die. You couldn't show the Jewish people enough miracles. They would not believe. It requires faith faith. You see, they weren't demanding miracles to overcome unbelief. It was because they wouldn't believe. Now, let me say that again because that is so deep and it's so prevalent in America today. They weren't demanding miracles to overcome unbelief. It was because they would not believe. Don't you have a friend who has said, listen, if God would just come down right now, and talk to me face to face, I would believe. No, you would not. You don't want to believe. The Spirit of God is bearing testimony in your soul. You are made in his image. If you do not believe, it's because you will not believe. The atmosphere in that synagogue was heating up pretty quickly. Then Jesus gave two little illustrations, and it causes them to now hit the boiling point. Verse 25, but in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. And great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And number two, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Number four, they would not believe because of their self-righteousness. 
His audience was religious. You know what? My audience is religious. You're a religious congregation. As was the same for Jesus, his audience was religious. You're not going to get more religious than a synagogue. And they were attending regularly. And they were saying their prayers and they are observing the law of God and they treasured God's law. They put it in a box on their forehead. They put it in a box on their wrist, in a box on their doorpost. They love God's word. But friends, our moral goodness often blinds us to our spiritual poverty. Jesus is about to expose that to them. Number one, he talks about a poor Gentile woman. She has a widow son. And there's a drought in the land and they're about to die from starvation. She has one more serving. She's got enough oil and flour to make one more cake of bread. And she's just going to gather sticks in order to make a fire to bake that bread, and then they're going to die. And Elijah stumbles upon her. And Elijah says to her so brazenly, make that meal, feed me first, and what's left over, feed to you and your son. And she did. She trusted. She had faith. She saw no miracle at that point. He had done nothing supernatural by that point. He just literally said, feed me first. Afterwards, what's left over, give to you and your son, and Yahweh will provide. And she trusted Yahweh to do it, and she was saved. Second, a Gentile Syrian leper. This is the number two man in Syria, enemy of Israel. And he goes to Elisha, the prophet of God, for healing. He's a leper. He's got leprosy. And Elisha tells him, go dip seven times in the Jordan. And Naaman, the Syrian leper, says, no way. My rivers back home are so better than these. I am leaving. I am so disappointed. In fact, he flew into a rage. But his servants said to him, Naaman, you came all this way for a healing. Can you not trust the man of God? And Naaman reconsidered and said, you know, I will trust And he dips seven times in the Jordan River. And when he came up that seventh time, the skin that was infected healed like baby newborn skin. He was saved. How? Was he saved by believing or by seeing rather a miracle? No, no miracle had happened. Not until after he acted in faith. But you, Jesus said to that congregation, do you not realize you are poor in your spirit? Do you not realize that you are captive to sin? Do you not see your blindness? Do you not know that you're under the grip of the devil? And you will not believe that I have been sent to you, that I am the Messiah, that there is more hope for Gentiles outside of Israel, the ones that you think God created to make the fuel for fire to burn uh, in hell. There's more hope for Gentiles than there is for you. And they knew what he said. They understood. They exploded in anger. They led him to the limestone cliffs of Nazareth to kill him. But he slipped from their midst. Luke doesn't tell us how. But the Bible contains, listen to this, no record of Jesus ever visiting Nazareth again. Never. So what's the application? I'm almost done. And as I work towards a close, let's consider a few points of this for ourselves. First, number one, you need to be honest. I don't know this answer for you. I have to answer it for me. Are you poor in spirit? You'll know that you're poor in spirit when you abandon all hope in your own righteousness before God. Have you seen that you are a captive to the power of sin, that no matter what you try, you cannot find a way to freedom in your own power? 
Have you stumbled through life going from one thing to another thinking that they're all going to be the answer that you've been looking for only to know and to realize and to understand that they have left you emptier than they ever, you ever were before? Have you realized that you are caught in the grip of the devil? He does not want to let you go. Do you know that every single human being, the Bible says, is either a child of the devil or a child of the Father? Don't for a minute ever say everybody is God's children. That is so not true. The Bible will not let you get away with that. You're either a child, child of the devil or you're a child of the Heavenly Father. And he does not want to let you go. But the redeeming power of Jesus will take you from his grasp without sweat because his father sent him to redeem. Have you heard about Jesus and the Bible so much? Heard about it so much, been to church so many times that it no longer grips your heart to hear about Jesus, that you no longer have a passion in your heart for, for him that is greater than anything else in the world. Your, your prayers are dry. The word of God is tedious to you. The moments that you do spend in it, you get nothing from it. Listen, if I'm describing you, you are part of this synagogue in Nazareth. That's where they were. And their ears were deaf, their eyes were blind. They could not and they would not believe that Jesus is the only way for salvation. Is that you? I have no idea, so you have to answer that question personally. But I'm telling you, if that's you, Jesus is telling you, he is promising you, I can save you. I will save you. Do you believe? Do you understand what I'm saying, Jesus says, at least to some degree? Are you persuaded that it's true? And do you trust me and will you commit your life to me? That's saving faith. It is the realization you are a sinner. You have no hope outside of Jesus. Nothing can save you. No religion can save you. Only the Son of God, your Redeemer, crucified on a tree, brought out of that tomb to give life to all who would believe. Now I am almost done. It could be about two more minutes. I'm going to flip it now. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Be honest. Don't tell me you don't have unsaved people around you, because I know you do. I do as well. When's the last time you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's the only way they can be saved. This is why Jesus, the Puritan, said God had one son. He made him a preacher. This is why Jesus said, I've come to preach. It is the proclamation of the gospel that will open the eyes of the people that you love so that they can believe. But if you will not tell them, thinking, I'll just be a good example. There's lots of good examples in the world. You might not even be as good of an example as an unsaved example. You've got to speak the word of God. You've got to share the gospel of peace. You've got to tell somebody about Jesus. That's the power unto salvation, Romans says. So when's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Don't be that synagogue. Don't be that Jewish person in Nazareth on that day. Let your eyes be opened. Let him bring you out of captivity to the year of Jubilee and then make you a messenger so that other people could hear and believe. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I love preaching on your son. Lord, it's no better person to preach about than Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that all of us, Lord, 
would have our eyes opened, Lord, all of us right now. Lord, there's no guarantee. I know, I know when I was four, I prayed a prayer, a sinner's prayer. My mom led me to it. But I don't really think I was saved then. Not until fifth grade when you came upon me in a searing power really struck fear in me that I was a sinner, that I was in need of a savior. You showed me my spiritual poverty. So Lord, there might be people here that, is, that are, are as religious as the Jewish people in that synagogue, but they might not know you. And you are inviting them. Your, your hand is out. Lord, I, I read somebody use the metaphor of you inviting us off the wall out onto the dance floor because you love us so much. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would open eyes of anybody that's hearing this online, anybody that's here right now that has not ever taken hold of your hand and left the wall. Open their eyes. Show them your love your kindness, your favor. Show them your power to save them. And I pray that they will reach out, Lord, enable them to do that. And Lord, let us be able to have the privilege, Lord, the blessing of declaring this to people, of telling people this week, maybe even tonight, talking to them about Jesus who loves them so much. He is the anointed one. He is the son of God. He came to redeem. He came to open up blind eyes, to set captives free, to take people out from under oppression. He came to declare the father's favors upon you. Lord, we get to tell people this. Lord, let us do that this week. We ask for your power in this, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Now, let's go out and be witnesses of Jesus, sharing the good news with people, even if they reject us. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you have a great week. Happy Father's Day!